And he was speaking to money and wealth and how most things don't exist or companies rather. And he said that the Ford Motor Company hardly exists. He said that it's just a time saving expression for a collection of financial interests. Again, all the Ford Motor Company was to this psychopath, just a time saving expression for a collection of financial interests. I thought that was such an interesting way, such a financially motivated lens to view the world through. And I just love the way that was phrased. What up, what up, folks? What's going on? Welcome to the Spun Today podcast, the only podcast that is anchored in writing, but unlimited in scope. I'm your host, Tony Ortiz, and I appreciate you listening. This is episode 243 of the Spun Today podcast. And in this episode, I speak about two Broadway musicals, which I can't believe I took this long to mention them, especially for one in particular. So definitely stay tuned for that. I also speak about watching the Succession series, an HBO series that I was definitely late to, but had the added benefit of being late in that it allowed me to binge the entire series. And lastly, I wrap it up with another addition to our legendary segment, Goats Doing Goat Shit, where we celebrate the true champions of greatness and highlight the phenomenal achievements of extraordinary individuals. Stay tuned for all that good stuff, but first I wanted to tell you guys about a quick way that you can help support the Spun Today podcast. Your support is greatly appreciated. Not only can it help out financially to help keep the lights on in good old Spun Today studios, but it definitely adds fuel to the motivational fire that I rely on to continue putting out episodes and even more importantly, finding time to write. Nay, making time to write. So thank you, thank you, thank you to each and one of you to each and every one of you that have shown your support to date and thank in advance to each of you that will show support in the future. Here is one quick way that you can help support the Spun Today podcast. Definitely stay tuned for the outro of the episode where I'll tell you about a bunch of other ways that you can show your support, but here is one of those ways. Then we'll jump right into the episode. The Spun Today newsletter is available to each and every one of my listeners absolutely for free. All you have to do is go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and drop in your email address. What I'm going to do is brighten up everybody's least favorite day of the week by delivering five curated things within my weekly newsletter every Monday at noon. You're going to receive a photo of the week, a recommended podcast of the week. I listen to tons of podcasts from an array of varied interests. I cherry pick the very best ones so that you can check them out. I also share a video of the week, which can be anything from a tasty recipe to a dope rap battle to an enlightening TED talk. I also share a quote of the week. And finally, for my fellow wordsmiths out there, a word of the week so that you can step up your vocab. Again, this curated list is yours absolutely free by going to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and dropping in your email address and you can unsubscribe at any time. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe, drop in your email address, and you'll get the very next one. The first musical that I wanted to tell you guys about was MJ the Musical. Here is the official synopsis. He is one of the greatest entertainers of all time. Now, Michael Jackson's unique and unparalleled artistry has finally arrived on Broadway in a brand new musical. Centered around the making of his 1992 Dangerous World Tour and created by Tony Award-winning director-choreographer Christopher Wheeldon and two-time Pulitzer Prize winner Lynn Nottage, MJ goes beyond the singular moves and signature sound of the star, offering a rare look at the creative mind and collaborative spirit that catapulted Jackson into legendary status. I went to check this out with my best friend, Steven. Shout out to Steven, Spun Today alumni, who has been on the pod several times in the past. 
we thought it would be cool to check out, you know, kid touching and molestation and all that, which has obviously tarnished Michael Jackson and how we view him, all that aside. And I know in and of itself, it's like a controversial topic where some folks are like, no, he, they're all 100% rumors and nothing like that ever happened. Nothing was ever proven in court. And then the other folks on the other side where, say, you know, the rumors have been rumors for decades for a reason. It's all true. It was even worse. I know the audience is split when it comes to that. From an artistic body of work perspective, he's obviously as the little synopsis says there, one of the most legendary entertainers of all time. Now from a, attending and, you know, watching this musical, and for someone who likes going to like Broadway plays and musicals and enjoys that genre of art and acting and, and singing and stuff like that as a consumer, from that perspective, we had a great time. And Michael Jackson in his heyday, I was a kid for that, a little kid, but I obviously know his, his music and his body of work. And I think you'd be hard pressed not to find or to find someone that wasn't aware of any of it. But I obviously never saw him live or anything like that. Going to see this play, though, the way they did it, you definitely get that experience, albeit at a much smaller scale. But you definitely get the like you feel you're watching Michael Jackson. That's how good of a performance not just the Michael Jackson characters did with it, but just the entire cast and the world that they built and created around it. And from a storytelling perspective, it was interesting how they did it. Because it is this very, and I guess makes sense in terms of it being like a deliberate conscious move to do it this way. So you don't have to bring in a lot of like the things we know about Michael now, the allegations and court cases and drug abuse and and stuff like that. So they didn't have to bring too much of that into the story. Because again, from a storytelling perspective, it's a very myopic focused view of his time around his 1992 Dangerous World Tour, which is his biggest tour ever, one of the biggest tours ever. And it was chronicling the buildup to that, all the practice sessions and how he was as an artist getting ready for that performance. And in the play, there is an MTV crew that was given access to chronicle this whole thing, to do a, a piece on you know, this very much anticipated world tour which was based on true events that MTV piece actually exists. And I'll link to it in the episode notes for you guys to check out. So we got to see this interesting view of that MTV camera crew trying to put together their creative vision of this documentary while also getting close enough access to Michael Jackson to see his inner workings and stuff like that and picking up on certain things like the beginnings of his drug addictions, which we know now ultimately led to his death in that he had a private doctor giving him shots or like IVs of trembuterol or something like that. I forget the exact medication name of what he ultimately died of, but it's supposed to be a strong ass sleep aid. And so much so that he was getting that shit injected on a nightly basis just to be able to try to get some sleep. And ultimately, that's what he died of. And the doctor that was prescribing him the medication wound up going to jail for a few years and losing his medical license, I believe. But in the play, it shows him getting drugs from his manager or other folks like that were uh, part of the stage team. I think it was his, his manager. And you get some insight into the all too common story of, you know, people in positions of power whether it's in art, music, politics, whatever, you, just having a circle of yes men and women around them that do what they want and don't really check them. And we saw that through the lens of, again, the beginnings of his drug addiction. And we also saw that same dynamic playing out with his financial team and how he wanted to pay for this over the top concert and do like never before happen things like him being shot out of not a cannon but something that shoots shoots him out and onto the stage and him running out of money and then pushing his 
accountant and his financial team to mortgage Neverland Ranch, where he lived, uh, just to continue funding this artistic vision that he had. Even though all the financial folks around him, lawyers, accountants, financial advisors, warned him against it, he still ultimately got his way, i.e. via these yes men. So that was definitely interesting to see. They also showed a direct correlation between his abusive childhood with how Joseph Jackson, the father, was always depicted as, you know, being super, super hard stage dad, forcing them to practice all the kids when they were the Jackson five for hours and hours on end. No breaks, didn't really have a childhood. You know, they had fame when they were young, so they didn't have a, you know, especially Michael being the youngest of them, of the Jackson five or second youngest, I believe but never really having a, a childhood or traditional childhood. They showed correlations of that instilled hard work ethic, and they kind of papered over the physical abuse in the play with how hard Michael Jackson was on his crew and the choreographers and, and the dance team around him and how they were all exhausted and he would force them to, to work hours on end, just like his dad did to him, and kind of showing that traumatic shift trauma shift of you know him being the recipient of that and then dishing it out as he got older in the same exact way and then seeing himself as you know becoming his father in that sense but the play did a great job in also showing different stages within michael jackson's life they showed him as a child you know as a flashback scene because the entire thing again takes place around him working up to this dangerous world tour and being interviewed by the MTV crew and them filming and interviewing him in between rehearsals, etc. But while they were interviewing him, he would flash back and tell stories of childhood, of his mother and his father, the Jackson 5, transitioning, going solo. And you got to see different actors, which did a phenomenal job of playing Michael Jackson. Now, we did go on an off day. Uh, I think it was like a Tuesday or Wednesday. So every cast member, including Michael Jackson, wasn't necessarily the number ones, if you will. I believe the young Michael was, but I don't believe the middle Michael that they showed, as well as the older Michael Jackson that's being interviewed. I think he was also the, the understudy. But I mean, these are all top tier phenomenal actors, right? All did an amazing job. And we got to hear all the hits, all Michael Jackson's hits, all Mike, uh, Jackson 5 hits. And it really did feel like a Michael Jackson concert experience. As a narrative choice, again, it does seem to me to have been a deliberate choice to tell this story from a specific point in time. And in doing so, not have to, or I guess they had the ability to paper over all the negatives that we know of Michael, like the drug abuse and child molestation allegations so on and so forth. So you definitely lose something historically from that perspective. But as a piece of entertainment, we do wind up enjoying a shitload of music and just how they put the the musical together. It was definitely an entertaining watch. And I definitely recommend it. MJ the Musical. Check it out. Back to the Future, the Musical. If you guys know anything about me, I am a huge Back to the Future fan. I've spoken about the movie multiple times. I've highlighted how the screenplay for Back to the Future 1 is considered a perfect screenplay, and I think it's taught in theater classes. It's my personal favorite trilogy of any genre, any movies, all time. And I've also said, controversial to some, that it's one of the rare occasions where the sequel, Back to the Future 2, is even better than the first movie. And I know that's blasphemous for some folks to hear. And even I myself go back and forth between that thought from time to time. But just from the creativity of it alone to delve back into the first movie through the second movie and find ways to tie into the first movie and make things that already existed within the first movie, make them that way because of the actions of the second movie, which was filmed and created, I think it was something like five years later. It's just fucking amazing from, from that standpoint. 
And I'm such a fan that my debut novel, Fractal, available now, spuntoday.com forward slash books. So you can find all the links of all the different places where you can find it. Back to the Future is an inspiration for that story. It is a time travel tale, as I like to say. Furthermore, I dedicated that book to my firstborn, Aiden. And the quote, the very first quote after the dedication section of the book is a quote from Back to the Future Part 1 from George McFly to Marty McFly, stating, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish absolutely anything. In him speaking to writing his first novel, so there's a complete tie-in on multiple levels there. I fucking love it. <laughs> I literally have a life-size replica of the hoverboard immediately to my left right now. That said, I signed up or like I follow all the different Back to the Future fan pages, official, unofficial. And I saw months before that they were developing the musical. I also subscribed to a bunch of different newsletters having to do with Back to the Future and the, and the DMC newsletter even from the DeLorean Motor Company. And I signed up to be alerted when the pre-sales went on and I bought these tickets months in advance. I think something like seven months in advance. That's how much I was anticipating going. So I copped the tickets and my wife and I, shout out to Zoila, sponsored the alum, went to go see it and had an amazing time. Being such a fan, holding, I'm both holding the musical to a very high bar. I don't want them to fuck it up. While at the same time being completely biased and knowing that I'll find a way to love it some way or another. So holding my love for the story and the history of the film aside as much as is humanly possible and attempting to be objective, I personally thought they knocked it out the park. Now they clearly didn't have, I'm not sure if Back to the Future, if it's old enough, I think it came out in 89, where the story itself is public domain or if they actually got the rights to retell the story in this format because I don't believe that Robert Zemeckis and, and Bob Gale were involved with, with the musical. Could be wrong, but I don't believe they were. And I wonder if certain choices that they made throughout the, the musical had to do with not having the full rights or if they had to do with just trying to retell the story on the stage. Because although it was still very, very, very true to the original Back to the Future 1 film, which was another thing that I was curious about if they were going to try to encapsulate all three films within the musical, but it wasn't. It was just a retelling of the, the first one. But everything is not, you know, word for word, verbatim, although it does have a lot of the same key scenes. But then certain other key, certain other key scenes, for example... The famous skateboard scene in front of the diner when Biff and his crew chase Marty and wind up crashing into the manure truck and Marty's getting around the skateboard. They didn't redo that scene, but in its place, they kind of extend the scene of the lunchroom where Marty first confronts Biff, you know, where they both kind of grab each other and make fists and they're about to punch each other, but then Strickland shows up. And breaks it up, essentially. And Biff tells him, why don't you make like a tree and, and get out of here? They elongated that scene instead and made that the chase scene. And made it so that Biff was chasing Marty throughout the lunchroom. He was jumping over tables and hitting him with lunch trays and running through the school. And they had an original musical number there. So they took certain liberties that way. I guess it, it was easier to do it that way. If it wasn't like licensing issue or concern it was easier it must have been easier to put that together versus the actual skateboard scene and having multiple cars and etc but it was something that i was curious about it was kind of inter interactive in that you know they they had the enchantment on the uh, the sea dance and during it when marvin berry and the starlighters are playing earth angel there were in the actual theater there was uh bubbles there was a bubble machine or something, and there was bubbles going all throughout. So the, we were in the first few rows, and you know we could swat the bubbles, and that kind of built the atmosphere around around the whole thing. Then, of course, he did the Johnny B. Good scene. In terms of the cast, 
all phenomenal. The gentleman who plays Doc killed it. Oh, and that was another thing also. They did not do the, you know, terrorist, Libyan terrorist shooting scene, which I guess to make it more PG, they made it that Doc was using the plutonium for the 1.21 gigawatt reaction that he needs within the flux capacitor to make the time travel possible, but that he was using an old radiation suit, which wasn't completely insulated. And that's how he wound up dying initially versus getting shot by the terrorists. But yeah, the gentleman who played Doc, amazing, super funny, steals the show. The guy who plays Marty is spot on, did a great job. But the person who played Crispin Glover's character of George McFly, dead on balls accurate, to quote Marissa Tomei. Fucking amazing, spot on. Like they could reshoot Back to the Future drop this gentleman in place of Kristen, uh, Crispin Glover who legend has it was like an absolute asshole on set and that's why he wasn't in part 2 or 3 but drop him into that role and you wouldn't tell the difference he was amazing fucking awesome the guy who played Biff was really good really looked the part which brings me to the number one star of the show the DeLorean. They did it so ill that it looked like an actual real DeLorean that was up there. Like I guess they just, you know, it's just like the outsides or whatever, but it really looked like an actual replica real DeLorean. And it's obviously the moment that all the fans are anticipating the most, you know, when they first see the DeLorean, which they did the big reveal in like the same same way at, at Twin Pines Mall which then becomes Lone Pines Mall at the end when Marty runs over Old Man Peabody's pine tree, symbolizing how the littlest change in the past could affect, have a ripple effect on the future. But they did an amazing job with the car itself and then with the actual time travel sequence. So the theater, the decor of it, can't also, this is how it also immersed the the crowd aside from the bubbles thing from, from earlier. The decor... The balconies on the sides, on the left, on the left and the right, they were also part of the decor. Like there weren't people sitting in the seats there. Instead, they had this metal widgets and circuitry spanning all of the balconies. And during the time travel sequence, when Marty accidentally goes back to 1955, all those start lighting up in different colors and reminiscent of the flux capacitor and the lights around the, the actual DeLorean, which they also show and really immerse you and bring you into it in that way. And then at the end, which was even more amazing because they could have just done that again. They with like a crane or something, something you couldn't see, but some sort of lift. They lift up the DeLorean for the scene where, you know, the clock tower scene when he's going back to the future. They lift up the DeLorean and push it forward into the crowd. So it's hovering above us almost, like above the first couple rows. Not completely, but just enough for it to be off of the stage. Could you imagine the fucking loss of that thing would have fallen or something? <laughs> but obviously it was, it was secure and it was just like so ill the way they did it. And I couldn't have been happier with Back to the Future, the musical. I definitely, definitely highly recommend. If I have the chance to see it again, I definitely will. Tickets should be a lot more reasonable now. That's the only issue I had with it, although I was willing to pay, so whatever. But apparently it's not doing well or as well as anticipated. And the ticket prices I checked the day of for my same seats and it was like 40% less in terms of the actual pricing. But that aside, it was an amazing experience. I loved every bit of it. If you're a Back to the Future fan as I am, you will too. Back to the Future the Musical. Check it out. HBO's original series, Succession, is a series that ran from 2018 to 2023. Like I mentioned in the intro, I didn't start watching the series until 2023, literally while the final season was was airing. So... That came with the benefit of being able to binge it and see it all the way through. 
But in terms of sharing some of my personal takeaways and tidbits here, it shows a bit out of the zeitgeist. And some references might be dated, but we'll share them nonetheless for posterity. Here is the official synopsis. The Roy family is known for controlling the biggest media and entertainment company in the world. However, their world changes when their father steps down from the company. And as we like to do here on the Spun Today podcast, I wanted to shout out each and every one of the writers, starting with the show's creator, Jesse Armstrong, followed by Jamie Carragher, Susan Soonhee Stanton, Alice Birch, Miriam Batty, she a baddie, she knows she a 10. Georgia Pritchett, Tony Roche, Nathan Elston, Callie Hershaway, John Brown, Will Tracy, Lucy Preble, Jonathan, Ted Cohen, Anna Jordan, Mary Laws, and Will Arbery. Shout out to each and every one of the writers on Succession who put together an amazing show. And I particularly want to shout out the, the writers in this particular series because they took what is the embodiment of quote unquote evil rich people, you know, just like the vile, borderline sociopathic, narcissistic archetype of, you know, the greedy, quote unquote, greedy rich people. And they made us, the viewers, through the strong characters that they created, that the writers created, and that the actors, which were phenomenal, that I'll speak to in in a minute, brought to life. They made us, as the audience, connect with those characters. And in some cases, in a lot of cases, actually root for them to win. Which if you take a step back and look at the ruthlessness with how they navigate the world with little to no care of who or how they affected others, when you look at it objectively objectively through that lens, it's like, fuck these people. But since they're developed so richly as characters, and it's such a character-driven show in my opinion, we still connect with them and root for them on a human level. And that I think is a testament again to just amazing writing. So shout out again to, to the writers there. Now the cast absolutely killed it. Kieran Culkin is one of my favorite characters. He plays Roman Roy, the youngest of the four children. Brian Cox is the matriarch, the Rupert Murdoch-like character who created this conglomerate multi-billion dollar company. He's just amazing. Tom Wamsgans, played by Matthew McFadden. Such a cool character. Very selfish, <laughs> it turns out, as as all of them have traits of selfishness. But he was in it for himself from the jump. And he plays possum throughout. So much so that he's married to Shiv Roy, the daughter, played by Sarah Snook. Also does a great job. But she's like a, you know, princess, always gets what she wants, kind of has a quote unquote trophy husband, cheats on him, and he just takes it all. And his character is such that you hate him at first because he's such a pushover and you're like, yo, stand up for yourself, you fucking pussy. Then you wind up rooting for him. Then you wind up finding out that either he's been running a game the entire time or he just got caught up in it and began running a game somewhere along the line and became fed up. Great characters. Both um, in real life British, I believe. It's a good job with the American accents there. Same as uh, Logan, Logan Roy's character, Brian Cox. And by British, that's just my dumb American interpretation of their accent. You know, it could be Australian, New Zealand, or <laughs> who knows. Conroy, the eldest half-brother, played by Alan Ruck. Shout out to Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Really cool character. Shout out to the con heads out there. Jeremy Strong. Not the eldest, but the eldest of the full siblings of the three. You know, Kieran Culkin's character. Sarah Snook's character. And himself, Kendall Roy. He was the heir to the throne, if you will. And in the very first episode, which sets the stage for the entire series, the first half of the episode is him going through... The process of getting ready to take over the company because the father had announced his retirement. He's going to step down. Kendall Roy is going to take over. 
And in that very first episode, the father winds up literally fucking him over and saying, nah, I changed my mind. He's like, wait, what? My, you changed your mind. I'm supposed to take over next week. He was like, nah, let's give it a couple more years. I decided to stay on. He was like, but we announced it to the world and the, you know, it's a publicly traded company and the stock and this and that and blah, blah, blah. He was like, yeah, that's all bullshit. Don't worry about it. And you have this tension within the family always throughout the entire series of the son trying to take over from the father, the father trying to maintain control, the father getting sick, the other siblings trying to vie for, for control, sometimes being on the same page with each other, most of the time not, and just like this complete dysfunction. And it was such an interesting family dynamic that really keeps you hooked. I also thought it was particularly interesting the way that the show is shot. And I got this from some of the, not behind the scenes, but the extras of the show where they, you know, interview different characters and they also have a podcast, etc. So I don't remember if it's from one of the extras or from the actual podcast, but one of the directors, I think the main one, Mark Millard, maybe it was Jesse Armstrong, the creator of the show, but they were breaking down how they shot in a way where they zoom in to the actual characters for emotional exclamation points. That's what they called it. And you notice that throughout the entire series where they'll, you know, they'll shoot a scene and then for the character reaction, they'll zoom in to the character's face, which is uh, pretty interesting. And he also mentioned that on set, they always kept live cameras around so that the art, the actors themselves they didn't know when they were being shot or not so it forced them essentially to stay in character and he likened it to filming theater similar to when you go see a play how all the characters as long as they're on stage they're in character you know that whether they're the main focus of a scene or not or a background character they're always doing something they're always on if you will then I'm going to jump to, in season two, episode 10, I jotted down here, there was a dope line that Logan Roy said. Again, the matriarch of the family, played by Brian Cox. And he was speaking to money and wealth and how most things don't exist. Or companies, rather. And he said that the Ford Motor Company hardly exists. He said that it's just a time-saving expression for a collection of financial interests. Again, all the Ford Motor Company was to this psychopath, just a time saving expression for a collection of financial interests. I thought that was such an interesting way, such a financially motivated lens to view the world through. And I just love the way that was phrased. All the Ford Motor Company is is just a time-saving expression for a collection of financial interests. Jesus. There's a lot of double-crossing in the show. The siblings with each other, the father to the to the kids, the kids to the father. There's a point in the season two finale where you think Kendall is going to rise to the occasion and, you know, be the heir to the throne that the father, you know, wants him to be, that is grooming him to be. But he winds up double-crossing his father again as he did multiple times throughout the series. And I thought it was interesting that he had a lot of ups and downs. You know, he had addiction issues. In the show, they reference all the time that he had a stint in, in rehab. And just from a mind state perspective, he was always either completely out of it and crying in the dumps or completely manic and on the fucking ball. He reminded me a lot uh, of Kanye and or the public version of Kanye that, that we've been seeing in you know, recent news and media cycles and with all the drama around the Kardashians and all that shit and his manic episodes. That's what uh, he was reminiscent of to me. I loved the relationship between uh, two ca two main characters, uh, both outsiders of the family in their own right, which was uh, Tom Wamsgans, which I mentioned earlier, which was the husband of the daughter, Shiv Roy. His relationship with Greg Hirsch played by Nicholas Braun, which is a second cousin, extended cousin to the family that they barely know, but that works his way into the fold. And Tom brings him under his wing, kind of because he sees himself in, in Greg, in some ways, you know, being an outsider of the family, but also because he wants to have someone to have power over. 
and he finally found someone lower than him on the totem pole, if you will, within this family structure. And they just have a back and forth, funny, quippy, really interesting dynamic throughout the entire series. And I'll wrap it up with a a line of dialogue from Alan Ruck's character, Connor Roy, when, spoiler alert, this happened in season four, episode seven, but Connor, who decides to run for president out of all things of the United States, <laughs> and Kieran Culkin's character, Roman Roy, hilariously tells him, don't you think you should try for something smaller first? You know, maybe like running a CBS or something? <laughs> Connor gets himself in a position where essentially his actual, you know, the two rivals for, for president, the Democrat and the Republican running, they're neck and neck, like razor sharp, you know, 49% to 49% margins. And Connor is polling at like 1% or something like that. So, so something, something sick that pretty much put him in a position to make a deal with one of the other guys where he would drop out of the race and his supporters would vote for that person and that person would essentially become the the president and he's trying to see what he can get you know what position he could get from the person that would ultimately win and one of them offers him to be the diplomat of oman which is a country that i had, had never heard of and he tells him that it's an interesting thought he'll he'll definitely mull it over and that oman is the poor man's saudi arabia and the rich man's yemen and again, I just thought, what an interesting way to view the world and view things. But yeah, yo, Succession, dope show. I definitely recommend you guys check it out if you're into that type of thing. It's supposed to be loosely based on Rupert Murdoch and, you know, Fox News, that type of billion dollar conglomerate company and the tension and dynamics within his children, for example, Rupert Murdoch. I think I've spoken about here in the past. One of them is like liberal, liberal leaning, which is kind of like Shiv Roy's character in succession and the other one is uh, very conservative and they're both vying for succession of, of fox for example so this show is loosely based on that or at the very least it's like one of those art imitates life imitates art type of things but that is my little recap and review on succession streaming now on hbo max check it out doing goat shit and I want to create a drop for specific to this segment of the podcast because it is a recurring one. And I have some things that I've been tinkering with and working on, but speaking it aloud to see if I can hold myself to task because I've been meaning to do that forever and just haven't gotten around to it. But the Goats Doing Goat Shit segment is a segment where I like to celebrate the true champions of greatness and highlight the phenomenal achievements of extraordinary individuals, especially when they do things that they do not have to do. And in this episode's edition of Goats Doing Goat Shit, I'd like to welcome none other than Sean P. Diddy Combs to the list. Now, for the longest time, and still, Puffy is known as being a ruthless businessman, if you will. Someone who hustled and busted his ass and built and created Bad Boy Entertainment, which has brought us countless acts and music that we all love to this day, and many, many artists. But one thing that he did in building his empire from the ground up was recreate the, what some may say, myself included, archaic, traditional, let's call them music artist deals where the label that signs an artist winds up owning their publishing, their masters, essentially making the lion's share of the money that is to be made from the art created by the actual artist. And the artist is often times in doing this type of bad business left fending for scraps and music artists. Historically, this has happened to across different genres since the beginning of time some but few and far between have had more savvy you know teams and lawyers and sound financial advice around them and just the the foresight of ownership of your creation being able to reap the benefits of it in perpetuity versus you know taking a, a bigger bag up front but then never being able to profit from it down the line so that's definitely been the biggest knock in my opinion on on puffy over the years 
in, in this respect. As of September of 2023, it became public that Puffy was returning his publishing rights, which, by the way, he did not legally have to do, returning the publishing rights to the artists and songwriters that helped him build Bad Boy Entertainment. Folks like Mace, which was the most vocal, and actually recently dropped, and by recently, I mean within the last year or two, diss tracks and did a lot of interviews and references uh, to all of this, which are actually pretty good. Faith, The Locks, which is another vocal component uh, of, you know, Puffy's business practices. 112 and the estate of Biggie, the Notorious B.I.G. They are all getting or have gotten their publishing back because the paperwork and agreements have all been signed and are actually finalized. And according to Puffy, in an interview that he gave to Billboard, he had a lot of offers back in like 2021 when, you know, like folks like Justin Timberlake and Shakira and a lot of folks were selling their their publishing, their their catalogs for like $100 million, $300 million, etc. He got an offer, an alleged nine figure offer to purchase his catalog, which included all the publishing that he own, owned legally from all these artists and that's when he supposedly decided to not sell and give the publishing back to the respective artists it just took a lot of time uh, between then and now to actually execute the legal documentation etc but i thought that was a dope move it wasn't something that he had to legally do did puffy make over the decades a shitload of money off everybody's catalog Yes, of course he did. Was he legally correct to do so? Yes, he was. Whether it was ethical or moral or not, and hypocritical in in some sense, those are all valid criticisms in my opinion. But he wasn't technically or legally, it wasn't something he had to do. So I definitely applaud him for doing so. I'm always of the mentality of just own your shit and be of the mindset that if someone a publishing company, a label if you're in music, a publishing company if you're in you know writing or creating different uh, types of art, a platform, etc. If they're coming to you with a bag to purchase outright, whatever it is that you created, big bag, small bag, whatever, they would also pay you for just licensing it. It'll be a smaller bag, but in my opinion, and I'm not the fucking messiah here but in my opinion if you're offering me a big bag to just own my shit outright it's because you from a financial standpoint believe that you're going to make that money back and more over time so it would also be a sound business move from your perspective to license it for a smaller bag for a shorter period of time because you will also make your money back within that shorter period of time and then some and in that type of scenario you keep your shit then afterwards license it out to someone else make money off of it yourself maintain the ownership so you could do whatever it is that you want with it in the future turn your book into a movie turn it into a tv series after that do both at the same time turn it into a fucking star spectacle that hasn't even been created yet but will exist in 10 15 years and since you have the ownership of your ip you could do that instead of handing it over for a bit bigger bag now And then the company that purchased it from you maintains that ability moving forward. So, again, with that said, I'd like to welcome Sean P. Diddy Combs officially onto the Spun Today Goats Doing Goat Shit list. And that, folks, was episode 243 of the Spun Today podcast. Thank each and every one of you very much for listening. I really, really appreciate it. Before I let you go, just wanted to tell you guys about a f- few quick ways that you can help support the Spun Today podcast if you so choose. Your continued support is amazing. I appreciate it very, very much. Whether you're using my affiliate link to shop on Amazon, which you can find at spuntoday.com forward slash support, or you're buying t-shirts or coffee mugs or my books, spuntoday.com forward slash books, or using any of my affiliate links that all can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support which will get you a discount on whatever said thing that it is that you're looking for. 
that I have an affiliate link for. Whichever way you choose to support, it means a ton. I really, really appreciate it and just wanted to say thank you. Here's a breakdown of a few of the different ways you can help support the Sponsor Today podcast if you so choose, and I'll check you all out next time. Peace. What's up, folks? Tony here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I enjoy producing it for you. Here are a few quick ways you can help support this show. You can support the Spun Today podcast by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. There you'll find my merch section where you can cop the iconic podcasts versus anybody t-shirt in a wide variety of different colors in all different sizes. Also, if you're into cycling, you can cop the super soft, comfortable, minimalist design Spun Today Bike Club t-shirt. Also available in a bunch of different colors and all different sizes. There are a few other designs of different types of t-shirts. Definitely go there and check it out. SpunToday.com forward slash support. It's the merch section. We can also get a dope coffee mug. I have coffee mugs with the brand new redesigned Spun Today logo on one side and the tagline that I end every show with on the other which is start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. The mug is available in both black and white because we don't discriminate here at the Spun Today podcast. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash support and check out the merch section. You can support the Spun Today podcast by checking out my writing. You can go to spuntoday.com forward slash free writing and check out some of my free association writing, which is intended to be some cathartic free writing but oftentimes doubles down as motivation for myself and others. At spuntoday.com forward slash short stories, you can read a bunch of the different short stories that I've written and actually listen to the audiobook versions of those short stories there as well. Another way you can help support my writing is by going to spuntoday.com forward slash books and checking out what I have in store for sale. Digital copies are available in all formats whether it be Kindle, iBooks, or a different type of e-reader. You can also purchase paperback copies, if that's your preferred reading method. Currently available, I have my nonfiction, Make Way For You, which is a collection of freely written thoughts that were curated and put together as tips for getting out of your own way. Also available is my debut time travel novel, titled Fractal. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash books to show your support. Support the Spun Today podcast by following me on social at Spun Today on Twitter, at Spun Today on Instagram. Please also check out and like my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Spun Today, and subscribe to my YouTube page as well. On my YouTube page, not only will you get these full length episodes, but you'll also get to check out some chopped up clips and bonus content. To get to my YouTube page, just search Spun Today on YouTube or click on any of the YouTube icons on the footer of my website. Also, don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever it is that you're listening. It really does help. The Spun Today newsletter is available to each and every one of my listeners absolutely for free. All you have to do is go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and drop in your email address. What I'm going to do is brighten up everybody's least favorite day of the week by delivering five curated things within my weekly newsletter every Monday at noon. You're gonna receive a photo of the week, a recommended podcast of the week. I listen to tons of podcasts from an array of varied interests. I cherry pick the very best ones so that you can check them out. I also share a video of the week, which can be anything from a tasty recipe to a dope rap battle to an enlightening TED talk. I also share a quote of the week. And finally, for my fellow wordsmiths out there, a word of the week, so that you can step up your vocab. Again, this curated list is yours absolutely free by going to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and dropping in your email address, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe, drop in your email address, and you'll get the very next one. If you want to help support the Spun Today podcast financially, you can do so by going to spuntoday.com forward slash support. Here you'll find a few different ways that you can do so. You can shop on Amazon, but first go to my website, spuntoday.com forward slash support. Click on the Amazon banner, which will take you to Amazon's website where you do your shopping like you normally do. It will not cost you anything extra, but I will get credit for driving traffic to their website. Another cool way that you can help support this show is through Patreon where you can set up reoccurring donations to my podcast, whether it be $1 per show, $2 per show, etc. 
and depending on how much you choose to pledge, you will receive some Patreon perks in return. Things like free writing pieces, free bookmarks, free digital copies of my books, etc. Again, my Patreon link can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support. You can also set up similar reoccurring payments via my Ko-fi page. And if you want to send a one-time happiness bomb donation, if you will, you can do so via my PayPal link. Again, all of which can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash support. If you're a fellow creative, a cool way that you can help support the Spun Today podcast and actually be part of the podcast is by filling out my five question questionnaire located at spuntoday.com forward slash questionnaire. Here you'll find the five open questions related to your craft, your art, what inspires you to create, what type of unrelated hobbies you're into, and what motivates you to get your work done. You can choose to remain anonymous or plug your website and your work. And once you submit your questionnaire, I read your responses on a future episode of the Spun Today podcast. It's completely free at no cost to you. And what I like to say about it is that if your responses could potentially spark inspiration in someone else, why not share that? SpunToday.com forward slash questionnaire. And as always, folks, substitute the mysticism with hard work and start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. Thanks for listening. I love you, Aiden. I love you, Daddy. I love you, Grayson. I love you, Daddy.